You know those people? The ones you tell that the time of an event is 15 minutes early because you know that they would be late. The ones that would be late to their own funerals, as the saying goes. Well, that's me. Prepare as I might, I can never seem to get anywhere on time. It's the most frustrating trait ever. Yet, it's absolutely always my fault. Before I had my daughter, Bryn, almost nine months old, I was one of those people who took punctuality very seriously. I was the kind of guy who looked up the traffic flow on his phone to make sure he got gas the day before. I even set my own oven five minutes fast so that there would always be an advantage. I was prepared for most obstacles. However, what I couldn't prepare for was the unpredictability of Bryn. Her needs and her moods varied as all babies do. There was no rhyme or reason to her play. She did what she wanted, when she wanted, no matter if it made sense or not. It's like she was saying, no, dad, I will lay here and eat my food for exactly one minute and 27 seconds. If you attempt to remove it before this time passes, you will be met with total non-cooperation. Not to mention crying and flailing of the limbs. We had a good enough routine before her mother left us about three months ago. Since then, we have just tried to make the best of our situation and establish a few new routines for Bren and me. Those were the thoughts going through my head as I rushed to Bryn's nine-month doctor checkup. We are early, set, and out the door. Then she pokes the nipple through her bottle and pours it all over herself. So we go back into the house, clean her up, and repeat the process. It's 9.19 and her appointment is at 9.30. It will usually take 20 minutes to get there. I'm not going to super speed or lane weave just to be on time. We will have to be a little late. Again. As usual. We're almost there. Only about five miles left. I start to allow myself to relax my shoulders a little when Bryn starts wailing. Oh Christ, not again. Not now, I think to myself, figuring she's poked her bottle open again. You can't take a dirty baby to the doctor, ever, but mostly not for a checkup. It just doesn't look right. It isn't right. The pitch and repetition of her screaming are making my head feel like a kettle that's about to boil. Before it reaches its crescendo of shrill railing, I pull over. If I knew then what I know now, I would have never stopped or would have pulled into the nearest gas station, anything other than where I chose to stop at. I pull over and get out of the car and open the door to the back seat. There she is, snotty and red-faced, her cute blonde curls sticking to her face with the sweat of frustration. My little sweetheart, she looks just like her mother when she cries. It makes me sad, but I can't think about that now. She knew what she was doing when she left us. No sense in keeping a ghost around, especially in my own head. We pull over next to a little roadside memorial. A slightly worn but still pretty silver and pink cross is placed with flowers withered by the hands of time and various other trinkets of memorial. The name on the cross reads Emily Semple. It looks to be a child's. That makes me sad to think about than when I thought about my wife. It's something, at least I thought. A temporary mental vacation to someone else's hell to be able to escape my own. I look her over and thankfully she hasn't spilled her bottle. Maybe we have a chance of being someone on time. I hand the bottle back, wipe her face and kiss her forehead, thinking if I show her love, it will calm her down. 
As if she could read my mind, she threw her bottle and it bounces off my forehead and onto the floor. Great. I haven't realized how much of a shameful mess my car has become. Napkins, empty bottles, condiment wrappers, baby toys, and even a french fry or two. In my effort to retrieve the bottle, I've knocked some things out of my car onto the roadside. The wind starts to blow some of them onto the road. So, not wanting to travel too far away from my car, I grab what I can and stuff the items back into the back seat on the floor, to be cleaned or forgotten about at a later date. We make it to the doctor's appointment a whopping 20 minutes late. I sheepishly grin and apologize, hoping they can still see her and I don't have to make another appointment to come back. The front desk lady's voices are understanding, but their eyes certainly had not been. Perhaps they softened when they saw me juggling my baby car seat and a very loud pink diaper bag falling off my shoulders repeatedly as I try to continue to calm her down. Yes, she was still wailing away. A nurse with a worn face but kind eyes comes over to us. Now, little lady, what seems to be the matter? That face is too beautiful to be scrunched up and screaming like that. Are you hungry? Do you want Daddy to rock you? She turned and gazed to me with a smile. Why don't you take her out, Daddy, and bounce her in your arms a bit? Some babies just hate to be in their car seat longer than they have to be. I smile, thank her, and take her advice. Just as I get her out and sit down with her, the door opens. Michael Hollander and baby Bryn, we are ready to see you now. Come on back to room four with the white and yellow clouds. I gather up all our things and head back to the room. Bryn finally settles down and snuggles into my shoulder. Her thumbs in her mouth so I knew all was well in Brynville. That's one of her happy places. Taking the thumb train to Brynville, her mum used to say. Two vaccinations and a few spoons of ice cream later, we pull back into the driveway, ready to recover for the whole ordeal. As I pull her seat out of the car, I notice a little pink elephant with a yellow star on the side. I pick it up and hand it to her as I take her into the house. Hmm. I don't remember buying this for her. It probably came from her grandmother's house. She always dotes on her. Every time she is out and sees something babyish, she gets it for her. It was just too cute, and Mimi couldn't leave it there when Bryn would love it so much, she says. Rena, or Mimi, as she proclaims herself, is Bryn's maternal grandmother. Since my wife left us, she's gone above and beyond to step up and be there for us. I think it makes her feel better about the situation as if she somehow feels responsible for her daughter's selfishness and actions. My mother is long gone and Rena is such a beautiful part of Bryn's life. I would never do anything to take that away from either of them. It's hard to find people you can trust to help you, and it's become so hard to do on my own. My phone rings. Speaking of, it's Rena calling. She had told me to call her after the appointment was over and I'd forgotten. I quickly try to think of a somewhat acceptable excuse while I place Bryn in her crib. Coming up with nothing and mentally exhausted, I answer the phone. Hello? I answered. Hey Michael, how did baby girl's appointment go today? You know I worry about our princess, she said to me. A couple of shots and some tears. Nothing a little ice cream couldn't fix. She's in the 78th percentile for height and the 74th for weight. The doctor said she's doing beautifully, I reply proudly. I can hear the subtle sigh of release from her into the phone. Good. I'm glad she's doing okay. Do you both have plans for today? There was a hopeful tone in her voice as she asked. No, not really. I'm just going to get some cleaning done and maybe head to the store later to fill up the freezer. She made a sound of disapproval. Mike... You can't take her out running around all day. 
She just got shots today, and you don't know how she will handle them. Why don't you bring her here for the day? That way you can do all your shopping and clean the house in peace while I have Mimi and Bryn time. After the meltdown and change of outfits earlier, Mimi time does sound like a good idea. I would miss her, but I could get so much more done and maybe even take a nap. She'll most likely sleep most of the day anyway, as she always does on shop days. I agree, and tell her that I'll be over in half an hour. That gives me time to feed her lunch, pack her up, and bring her over. I start the car and turn on some tunes, and head down the road. It's a beautiful day, and for once I don't mind driving. I get to spend it fantasizing about my forbidden daytime nap I get to take later. I stop at what seems to be the hundredth stoplight, even though it's really only the third. Tom Petty's velvet voice comes across the radio, so I reach down to turn the volume up. The light turns green and I start to accelerate, humming along and excited to get to her grandmother's house. Suddenly I feel a shock painful enough to move my whole car. It feels as though my teeth are broken and cutting my cheek from the inside. My car flips once, twice. I feel my head bounce off the steering wheel. All I can think about is my back seat. The car comes to a stop on its hood. My body is burning with white hot pain. What I thought were my teeth were actually broken glass from the window. I must have gotten hit, possibly T-bone. I started to fear. My head swims and my eyes become heavy. I feel like a computer shutting down one application at a time. I'm trying to use all my senses to help me. I hear silence. No crying. No screaming. At first, I am terrified at the sound of her silence. I manage to look back at one mirror that survived the crash. I see my little angel in the back seat, upside down, firmly secured in her car seat, motionless. Her neck is bent at an unnatural angle and blood everywhere. The last thing I see before I lose consciousness is a little girl in front of my windshield. Her face is dirty and she is wearing what I guess must have been at one time a white dress with yellow daisies on it. I fade away. My eyes shoot open as the phone rings. I am at home in my chair. I jolt up and out to my mirror. I feel my head where it hit the steering wheel and there's nothing. There's no pain. No bruises or cuts. Nothing. Confused, I run to Bryn's room. She's sleeping peacefully in her crib. Either I am losing my mind, or that was the most realistic dream I have ever had. I rush to her. She wakes up and is smiling at me. Her little hands drop something as I lift her up. I look down to see the pink elephant with the yellow stars. I must have fallen asleep after her appointment today. The phone rings again and saddles me. My heart springs to life thinking that it might be my wife. Maybe her mum is calling to check on her. Say she misses us. That she's lost her mind and wants to come back. I look at my phone in its arena. I don't answer and let it go to voicemail. I'm still shaken up from that experience and need to get my shit together. I will call her later. My phone then buzzes with a text message. It's Rena, and it says, Hey Michael, just calling to check on Bryn's doctor's appointment today. If you don't have anything going on, please bring her over. I would love to spend the day with her. Talk to you soon. Well, I'm definitely not going to be driving anywhere after what happened earlier today. So I turn on Netflix for me and the kiddo. I pop some popcorn for myself and I sit down next to her on the couch. I let her snuggle into me and we settle in like that for a while. Halfway through my popcorn bowl, she starts to eye it. She would look from me to the bowl, then back again. She let out an irritated grunt and furrows her brow, looking towards my bowl. Smiling and thankful to have her, I let her have a piece. 
I walk to the bathroom, satisfied that she's at peace in the spot for a while. I am only then there for 45 seconds, a minute at most. The living room is silent. Bryn is on the floor, looking under the couch with her butt in the air. I wait to see what she's doing, figuring she will pop out some lost treasure out of there and try to eat it. She doesn't move. I walk over to her and call her out. You spilled that as popcorn, monkey butt. Did you find something good under there? She doesn't respond. Doesn't move. Doesn't breathe. My heart drops and I rush to her. I pick her up and roll her over. She's like a limp doll and her face is blue. I look over at the popcorn bowl. I try everything. I turn her upside down and hit her back. I try to put my fingers down her throat to remove the obstruction. There was nothing, nothing that I can do. It's just her lifeless body and the pink elephant at her feet. I moan and scream in agony as I fumble my cell phone to call 911. My head spins and I start to lose my breath. I look over out of my window and again I see the little girl wearing the dress with daisies outside and down the street staring in my direction. Things tilt sideways and the ground rushes up to meet me. I fade away. I wake up again to my phone ringing and once again I let it go to voicemail. My heart is beating so fast I can hardly catch my breath. I am very much still in the situation my mind just put me in. No surprise, it's Rena again. Or maybe for the first time? I'm not even sure at this point, honestly. I can't think straight. I have seen things no parent should have to see. Who is that little girl in the dress? Why is this happening to us? Again, I rush to Bryn's room. Again, she is there sleeping, holding the pink elephant in her hand. I take it away and set it aside. She wakes up and smiles at me. I reach down to touch her hand, and she reaches hers up to me, slowly falling back to sleep. I let it all melt away, soaking up her smile. Whatever is going on, whatever the hell I was stuck in right now, we are here, right now. We are very much alive and okay. Today won't do anything. There will be no car trips, no popcorn, no toys in the crib, no anything that can hurt my little girl. It's my only job in life to protect her, and I will die trying. The same text message appears from Rena. I decide to call her back. I try to sound as calm as I can, mentioning the same details about the doctor's appointment. This time, however, I decline her offer to come over, deciding not to tell her about the horrifying events of the day. We arrange for me to drop her off next Saturday and asks, What is baby girl doing right now? I reply, She's asleep in her bed holding on to that elephant. Hey. You have no idea how much she loves that. Where did you find it? There is a pause. Michael? I never got her an elephant toy. I would have remembered. I make an excuse about Bryn waking up and hang up the phone, feeling dazed. I go to Bryn. I will take her into my room and put her in my bed with me all day. Nothing can hurt us. We just have to make it through the day, and this nightmare will all be over. I approach the crib, and there she is. She lays silent, not moving, not breathing. I frantically look around the room for something to hit myself with, something, anything to make me pass out so we can begin again, so I can have my Bryn again. I lost her mother. I cannot and will not lose her too. Where she goes, I go. This is the only light left in my world. It turns out I don't have to find anything. 
I feel my breathing slow and the room tilt. The little girl in the dress, angry eyes follow me all the way to the floor. The phone rings. I wake up and ignore the call. You know the drill. I run to my daughter and wake her up. Only one thing matters today. I run to the car with her and strap her into the seat. We take off in the direction of the doctor's office. I pray I get there in time. No red lights, no accidents. I get to the pink and silver cross and pull over. The contents of my stomach's emptying themselves down the side of my car as I rush out of it. I open the back door and grab the elephant from Bryn. Her eyes are big and her lips puff with the thread of oncoming tears. That doesn't matter though. I have what I need. I look to the sky and scream, I'm sorry, Emily. We didn't mean to. Please leave my baby alone. I never meant to take this. She deserves to live. There are tears falling from my eyes and spit flying from my lips. Please. I gently place the elephant next to the cross and back away. I hope to God that I did the right thing. We just need to make it through one whole day.